Welcome to ACLT Presents New Models for Creating Thriving Black Communities and Inclusive Cities, a conversation series of the hashtag Thriving Black Communities campaigns. Let's welcome your host and the Emmy Award winning Treyana Holiday. Hi, everyone. Oh, my goodness, John. Thank you so much. Always amazing introductions. And we just want to start by thanking you guys for joining us. This is the final part in this four-part series, and it's been amazing. As John said there, we want to make sure that you guys know to keep the conversation going using the hashtag Thriving Black Communities. All right, well, you guys, uh, this is really exciting. This is the new models for creating thriving Black communities in inclusive cities. This four-part virtual conversation series has been hosted by Africatown Community Land Trust with nonprofits from four historically Black neighborhoods across the country. These nonprofits include Southwest Georgia Project, Houston Land Bank, Hill CDC, and Avalon Village. Today's conversation, Healing and Building Community Through Art and Creative Placemaking, is the final conversation in our series, and perhaps maybe the most important one. For the past four weeks, more than 300 people from all across the United States and the world has come together to discuss how we preserve the legacy, affordability, and economic viability of our Black neighborhoods. We started with a conversation with civil rights activist Shirley Sherrod from Southwest Georgia Project, who walked us through the history of Black land ownership. She and ACLT CEO KY King Garrett stressed how the land trust model could be used to protect land for Black farmers in, South, in the South, as well as for residents here in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere. During our second session, Krista Stoneham from the Houston Land Bank in Houston joined White King, where they shared about their work to reframe the narrative around our Black neighborhoods and to make sure that we build affordable housing and that we also build places and legacies in that building. Last week, we got to check in with Mariba Millions from Hill CDC in Pittsburgh, and she and Y King talked about the importance of being intentional in our economic development planning so that we do the work uh, to support Black businesses and entrepreneurs, and it not only builds community wealth, but is undone further down the line. And finally, today, Y King and Avalon Village founder and CEO Mama Shu will discuss how to use Black art and culture to build safe, beautiful spaces of, of comfort and healing. Well, after Y King and Mama Shu speak, we want to open the floor up to questions from all of you because, of course, we want you to be a part of this conversation. In fact, we're going to start right now. Like I said in the chat, tell us where you're from. Um, tell us if you've already been a part of this conversation series. One of the biggest things that you have taken away from these amazing conversations. And if it's your first time, you can also tell us, you know, what you're looking to learn in this conversation series. Um, if you're from an organization, please let us know as well, because we want to be able to uplift all of you. At the end, uh, you will have an opportunity to make a direct impact to this work by making an investment to ACLT and Avalon Village. And of course, as I said, be sure you use that hashtag, Thriving Black Communities, as we continue these conversations online. Well, we're going to start right here, and I'm going to give you a short bio of each one of our speakers so that you can be familiar with their work. First, our guest. She is a mother, a community activist, president of the Highland Park Board of Education, and the founder and CEO of Avalon Village in Highland Park. She and her team are building a self-sustaining eco-village in Highland Park, inspired by the memory of her sons, Jacoby Ra, who was killed at the age of two by a hit-and-run driver in 2007, and by the murder of her 23-year-old son, Chin Lu. After then, uh, rather than falling into despair, she chose to heal and honor the memory of her sons by transforming blight to beauty and uplifting her community. Her inspiring story has been featured on The Ellen Show, NBC Nightly News, and other media outlets. Let's welcome Shamayim Mama Shu Harris. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, so glad you could be with us today. Can't wait to hear more about your story. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And of course, our host, a third-generation community builder, 
social entrepreneur, and current president and CEO of Africatown Community Land Trust. He's been a co-catalyst for numerous ventures, including Africatown Seattle Community Development Initiative, Liberty Bank Building, Emoja Peace Center, Hack the CD, Black Dot, Emoja Fest, Africatown Center for Education and Innovation, and King County Equity Now. Let's welcome KY King Garrett. Thank you, uh, Trey. Always good to be here um, with you. Um, definitely thank you to the whole team behind the scenes uh, making this uh, happen. And, 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 and great to be here with uh, Mama Shu to have this important uh, discussion around our creative, you know, kind of outputs and our need for healing and our need for restoring um, and rebuilding our communities and how all these things integrate. Well, I'm looking forward to this discussion. We're going to get it started right now. Our first question, obviously, both Detroit and Seattle have rich Black musical history. Can you both speak to the significance of art in your own personal life and how it has informed the work you do now? I'll start with you, Mama Shu. So for me, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I am certainly glad to be here. Um, and it's good to see you again, Waikin. I remember you came and it was maybe about a year ago or so we saw each other and you came to the village. Um, so art has always been um, a part of uh, my life. I'm actually uh, a creature of beauty and comfort and order. And so um, I've always been able to look at something and find the beauty, whether it was, uh, you know, tore down, whether it was uh, blighted, but I've always been able to find um, uh, some space for um, healing beauty to, to, to come out. So that is just, I was always the person that um, decorated, um, you know, was in the art stores and things like that at an early age. And I just always have had an appreciation for the sight of beautiful things. Oh, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Mama Shu. Great intro to get us started into this conversation. Uh, Why King, I'll toss it over to you. You know, how has art, um, kind of been a significant part of your personal life and inform the work you do now? Sure. Um, great question. So for me, the early, you know, um, influences really were my my father, right? And so my father, Mark Tahir Garrett, um, he is, you know, well known for his community work and, you know, activism and, and fighting for our, our people. Um, but he really is a true Renaissance man, you know, and so just growing up in our living room, there's a B3 Hammond, there's a drum set, and he's inviting his different friends over to, you know, <laughs> play, right? And he's also a visual artist and a painter. And so, you know, there's art supplies, paints, things on, the, you know, his art on the wall from a, from a young age. Those are some of my earliest uh, memories. Um, I grew up in the 80s, so hip hop, you know, came into my life, you know, um, Beach Street, you know, came out, I think 1984 and, you know, break dancing, that, that's what it was. And um, it just evolved, you know, in the hip hop in terms of being more involved as, you know, an artist or an MC um, and eventually kind of into the industry. And so then when I, you know, come back to, um, uh, you know, my community after being, being gone, um, a lot of that gets kind of integrated into the work. And so, you know, just approaching things from a hip hop perspective, you know, even just the idea of Africa town, um, we think about how many different places in hip hop have been renamed without going to any uh, petition in any, you know, government, you know, administrative body. And eventually that becomes a, a, a internationally known name for that place where you're talking about Philadelphia, you know, for Philadelphia or, you know, so many other, you know, um, uh, uh, places. And so I'm um, just taking that approach of taking what you have, working with it. Um, one of the early institutions, the Moja Peace Center was built around a uh, recording studio and giving young people access to uh, be creative, you know, as an entry point and replacing negative culture with positive culture. And so, yeah, that's some of that, that's, that's kind of um, the, the personal and then kind of work journey around uh, music or arts, you know, as a sense of place. 
Thank you so much uh, for that. And, you know, I think it really sets our conversation up nicely because we we now want to really hear about the history of the organizations, you know, why it was important for both of you to do community development in a way in which you're not just putting up buildings, but creating living monuments that honor our past and the legacy of those who came before us. I'll uh, go ahead and toss this one first over to you, Waikin. Sure. I mean, you said it, living monuments. You know, when we come to our work, you know, we didn't want to just become, uh, you know, museum pieces, you know, and statues and plaques and murals in a community that we used to be. You know, it's one thing uh, for young people to go um, and see, a, you know, Jimi Hendrix guitar on the wall, right? It's another thing and, and read about him. It's another thing for them to be able to do that and then go into a studio and pick up a guitar, you know, and make music and really honor the legacy by keeping the energy, you know, dynamic and moving and in motion in real time, right? And so, um, you know, my, my father was the founder of, uh, led the African American Heritage Museum that's at Coleman School, led the occupation. And the whole idea was for that's to be a world-class museum and cultural center, right? So that in that space, there would be you know, studios, art studios, recording studios, film, video production studios. So as young as our young people are uh, made aware of the many contributions of Black people, particularly in the realm of um, arts um, and, and whatnot, that they would have the facilities again to um, take that inspiration and make new things out of it, right? And so, um, that, you know, it's from an institutional level. Um, and then just looking at, you know, where are we reflected in the built environment, right? And so, you you you, you know, um, all design, you know, is really kind of a form of art. And we know that, you know, the original architecture and things of that nature, we look to, to Africa, to, to Egypt or Kemet. But when we look into our communities, often we don't see ourselves reflected, you know, even, you know, we see us taking over and repurposing things that were designed for someone else's, you know, centering someone else, right, or, uh, and their values and their culture, you know, in our community, like one of our preeminent, you know, cultural institutions in Seattle is, is Langston uh, Hughes Performing Arts Institute. Now, that was a former synagogue, and you can see that reflected in the design and how it was structured initially, right? And so, um, again, as we migrated, we kind of uh, took what was there, but what does it mean to actually design centering Black well-being and Black ways of being, you know, um, as others have, right? And so, um, when we begin to think about the buildings that we're erecting, we wanted to see, look at how can we be um, uh, represented in the design of, again, the built environment, and then creating spaces where that culture and that history is happening uh, actively, you know, and, 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 and cultural and creative generation is, is happening um, because our just way of being is artistic and creative and we know just the style and we're constantly creating new language new ways of displaying our wardrobe and things of that nature taking whatever we have and so just creating space for that is important too and then also incorporating our actual um artists and people that make our community beautiful and so ultimately africa town is about you know making space creating space holding space for the beauty you know the brilliance and the best of the black experience, you know, regardless of time and location and to have that be re regenerated and renewed. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely speaks to to the living monument piece and, and that history and legacy. Thank you so much, White King. Uh, Mama Shu, same for you. You know, when you think about the ways that you do development, uh, you're creating those living monuments that honor the past and the legacy of those who came before us. How do you guys do that work? Uh, so uh, basically from the, the, the history of Avalon Village, um, I actually watched it for about four years, the actual block. And just like um, a lot of people do, um, they just, you know, they drive by it. Oh, that looks a mess. Um, that block right there surely needs to, you know, get fixed up. Uh, somebody needs to do something about it. Um, I was born in Highland Park and um, I was living on Rhode Island Street. 
I would drive past this particular block, Avalon Street, located in Highland Park, Michigan, between Woodward and Second. So it's the first block off of Woodward Avenue. And uh, I would just look over here and I would look at, it was just terrible looking over here. It was a lot of abandoned homes. Uh, it was boats in the, uh, in the vacant lots. There were mattresses, sinks. It was just, um, it was just really, really a, a, a depressing sight to actually see. But I, I was watching it for about four years. Um, in 2007, uh, when my, uh, my, my son Jacoby became an ancestor, he was actually hit by a, a, a car when he was two years, one month and six days old. And so this street that I watched, you know, I would, I would always think about, I'm gonna go over there and build a village. I was like, nobody loves the block because it was totally dead, abandoned. And to me, it was just barren. And I was like, wow, I wanna go over there. And this is all my thoughts for the whole four years um, living on Rhode Island Street, which is on the other side of Woodward Avenue. And so I would just drive by. So after uh, Jacoby became an ancestor, I remember driving by um, on my way, I was administrator. Um, I worked in the school system for 27 years. And so I was driving by, uh, going to my, you know, school job and everything. I worked at the Aisha Shule, which is was an African-centered uh, school in um, Detroit, Michigan. And um, I just wished to be over here. And basically I just kind of conjured myself over here. I began to actually see the beauty, what I could build. I want to get a homework house over here for the children. Uh, I can see a park being there and just this and then I would drive down the street and, and have coffee and sometimes sit on the corner and just kind of envision things. So when my son did become an ancestor, I recall six months after I happened to be doing my ride and I looked over and I saw a dumpster in the first property that um, I acquired on Avalon Street and I saw a dumpster in the driveway. And I was like, wow, they selling that house. And this was, I looked at this house. I was like, okay, I'm gonna put my ministry in there. I've been a minister for 20 years last year. And I said, I'm gonna start my ministry there. We're gonna go over there and clean up this block and make something beautiful for uh, Highland Park. And so um, I saw the dumpster, I was so excited. I made a U-turn, came on back down and I saw it was for sale. I called the, um, I called the broker and, uh, they, anyway, the house was like $5,500. And so I told him I had $3,000 and I didn't have nothing. You know how you just like, okay, I got the money, but then it made me race to get the money. So um, I said, I have $3,000. They said, okay. And then we closed. I recall using my work check. I had a, 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 a state income tax check that came. It was like $462. And my girl from Chicago gave me $1,500. She donated $1,500. And I was able to acquire the house. So when I came over here, I got that house. And simultaneously, um, I built a, a park for my son, Jacoby Ra, uh, and named it Jacoby Ra Park. Because he was hit by a car, I'm, I wanted to build somewhere safe for young toddlers under five with um, um, playground equipment off of the street. So it kind of sits back and they have all of the things that they need to um, uh, play with and just to, you know, just to have fun and exercise and, and be healthy and be with your family. But my uh, goal was uh, to basically transform blight to beauty. One of the things that I realized is that I didn't have to live and I didn't have to look at a mess. Um, I know that our city, um, you know, the financial constraints that we were under, um, you know, we, you know, couldn't afford uh, to, you know, get grass cut all the time. So as a citizen, I wanted to uh, do my part and make things uh, better and make things more livable because I know that I deserve this. I deserve this sitting on the porch and not watching um, and looking at a mattress every day or looking at a rat's nest across the street, just looking at all this blight. So my thing was, is that I did that for myself and I did it for the community as well, because I knew that I wanted to live uh, better. And so that is one of the things that drew me over here. And I knew that I wanted to somehow replace or put alternative things on this block that Highland Park uh, uh, had lost. Library, um, the school system was up under emergency management. Um, you know, just all the just just all of this loss that was happening to me. This was fertile grounds, 
this was actually one of the most uh, notorious blocks in Avalon, I mean, in Highland Park. I was a police officer for six years um, and uh, uh, the uh, first lady chaplain actually of the Highland Park Police Department. And I recall my chief when I was, um, you know, uh, uh, going through training and then just working, he was like, Harris, he said, you know, that's one of the worst blocks on, um, you know, in Highland Park. And so I didn't know that. So I got to say that intuitively I came over here and actually, and also um, I felt that it was my duty as a citizen that I wanted to pitch in and help. So actually I was drawn to this block, not knowing that it was many murders. Someone actually, this house that I'm sitting in right now, this is the homework house, but that somebody uh, got killed. It was a 19 year old on this, um, on the second floor. They sold crack. It was just that type of uh, block. And so people would always say, oh my God, you over there on Avalon Street. And now they can't believe what is going on over there because this was a block that was highly feared. Uh, I mean, people was in bushes with guns and it was gangs. They, they busted out all of the street lights so that they can actually, you know, so that crime could happen. And so I have to say that I didn't know that it was that, uh, you know, that type of energy when I came over here. But then I learned that this was a space where unfortunately a lot of uh, men became ancestors. A lot of young men became ancestors in this space. And I began to learn um, about it. And so basically that was my thing is just to take a chunk of what I felt that I can organize and that I could just do my part and come over here and just do that um, as well as uh, 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 just develop. And the very first thing that I built and, and, and that we built, and when I say I, I mean we. So, but, but the very first thing in my vision was to actually erect the homework house. Because in any city that you go to, or, and, and if you're raising families, you're gonna look at the school system. And our school system was up under emergency management at the time. So that was very, actually, this is the very first entity. It was also, a house that was on the demolition list. And it's, I mean, it was just brick as strong. And I was like, they can't tear this house down, you know? And, and so um, uh, we were able to get it off the demolition list. And so this was um, a property that we, it was boarded up and everything, it was burned. There was squatters in it and everything, but I knew um, where I wanted to take this. And so I was just patient. And that was my goal to come over here and just make something beautiful and to help restore uh, uh, this piece in Highland Park. Um, and I just continue to do things to heal Highland Park because it feels like we just been through a battle over here and people, there's so much loss. And to me, there was nowhere to go uh, but up. I felt that this block was uh, a Phoenix rising as well as many other blocks here in Highland Park. And I wanted to do my part. Mm. Wow, Mama Shu, thank you so much. I mean, you you just kind of answer some pieces of this, but um, you know, when when we think about Avalon Village, there's so much history there, and I'm it's just amazing to hear all the work you're doing there. Uh, but you also just completed a music camp for young people. Uh, you're creating the Goddess Marketplace, an economic development initiative for women made from uh, uh, shipping containers. Uh, local artisans will be able to sell their goods and grow their entrepreneurial ventures alongside other women who share their passion and creativity. Can you speak to some of these other innovative ways that your organization is using art and design as a tool for social change? So uh, one of the things that I want to mention um, as it relates to social change, and this has been um, something that I've been working on actually for years, was, um, and this has something to do with design, it has something to do with infrastructure, and it has something to do with some basic needs that a city should have, which is streetlights. Unfortunately, in Highland Park in 2011, our uh, streetlights were repossessed because of, you know, um, no funding, we could not pay that uh, electric bill. So what happened was is that they came and actually um, repossessed the lights in Highland Park. Uh, approximately 1200 poles were actually removed so that we wouldn't continue to use uh, electricity. So something had to be done. Um, and that was a decision that the mayor and the administration made at that time in 2011. And so uh, when they came to come get the lights, they came on the side streets all of the side streets don't have lights right now, and it's been 10 years. Last year, 
uh, well, actually in 2014, an organization uh, by the name of Solidarity, we worked together with them and we collaborated. And I recall at the time, uh, Jackson Copel, he was uh, the director, the executive director. And I remember telling him, this is even before 2011, I was like, okay, Jackson, I said, I'm building a village over here. I said, we need some solar street lights over here. And so it was a while before we got them, but we raised money for uh, one street light. Um, so this is actually Avalon Villages, uh, the very place where the very first solar street light in a residential area um, takes place. And I call it my block phone uh, uh, light because it's just like one of those old fashioned looking ones, but it works and it's been working since 2014. Uh, last year in 2021, we had the opportunity to, um, uh, we did a fundraiser, uh, Solidarity, and we did a fundraiser. And well, let me just tell you this part. First of all, we kept trying to get this grant, oh, this $100,000 grant. We we got up almost two times, two or three times, we got right up to the moment and everything. And then they voted on somewhere else. And so me and Jackson was on the phone one day and he was like, shoot. He said, look, he said, we got 20 grand or whatever um, sitting here. We could just raise money to get the rest. And let's just use this. Um, as seed money to go ahead and start our um, our campaign and everything. I was like, bet Jackson, we gonna get it. It don't even matter, you know, knowing we have been turned down and stuff. So um, I said, let's go, let's just go ahead and get it. And so we collaborated again and we were able to raise $75,000, which was matched by another organization, well, uh, half of it. And then the other uh, organization matched the other half. And so we were able to, uh, uh, get five solar street lights with Wi-Fi capabilities. Um, so that means our block of Avalon Village between Woodward and Second is the only lit block in Highland Park right now. Um, it has um, all of the people who donated to the campaign on the polls. And I just said the other one's my block, block phone because this these are more sleeker and sweet looking. Okay, they have the they have the names of everybody who donated on the plaque. And it's so beautiful and they're all tall and sleek. And actually the lighting illuminates almost um, 10 feet over the block. So it is just so beautiful. So when you ask uh, about ways that we're able to transform um, things socially, that happened and I felt, and I felt that uh, we as citizens, if that's what we wanted and that's what we need, then that's what we deserve. Yeah, we went out and made it happen. Um, and right now we're sitting here still without lights but Avalon is lit, believe me. And that job so that is was... project that we... Um... Sorry, yeah, there we go, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, and so Avalon is um, uh, 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 one of the most lit block um, in Avalon, on, uh, in um, Highland Park. Um, there are also about seven other solar street lights done by um, Solidarity as well. They're on private property and that was the thing too. Um, that they had to, uh, the city was not um, hearing at that at the, at that time to, uh, you know, uh, uh, help make it happen. And we approached them several times. And I remember telling Jackson, well, you know what, Jackson, here's what you have been. He's a younger person too. I said, you know, this is what you do. Just go ahead and light up one block. Sometimes you just got to crawl before you walk. Do a little bit at a time. And mm -hmm. guess what? The angry villagers ain't at our door. I'm just saying, because we got lights. So what happens is, is that everybody else is wondering why we don't have lights. And, and so sometimes we had to do that in order to uh, show what is possible, that we didn't have to live without some of the basic, very basic things like street lights. Wow, that is very- that's Just one thing uh, that I wanted to share about, you know, something that we shared as it relates to uh, 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 beauty at the same time in order. To me, that's order. Yeah. And, and removing street lights, it caused blight because what happened is on those stumps that they removed lights, it was cement stumps. And it just looked like a street light cemetery. And when you go on, all you see is these stumps where lights used to be. So what I did was with the children uh, in hood camp, actually, this is another camp in August. What we did was is that I had them build some planters, square planters over them. And so now there are beautiful planters that are sitting over them. And we had actually six street lights on our block. So that blight is covered up with a beautiful planter and also flowers on it, um, just you know, as a beautiful memory. And so that particular shrine or the death of something 
was covered up and also healed. Mm. That is, uh, I mean, that's what we're talking about when we think innovation. And I love how you uh, also infuse it, talking about using Wi-Fi, solar panels. I mean, these are the things that we get to do now with the technological advances that we have in our society. So thank you so much, Mama Shu, for giving us those examples of how you're being innovative there at Avalon Village. Uh, Wai King, um, you know, I'm going to come right to you here because ACLT broke ground on Africatown Plaza in February. This is a development which will not only offer 126 units of affordable housing, uh, commercial and community space, but it will also integrate multiple public artworks, murals, and art collections. Um, can you speak to you know this and other innovative ways that ACLT is using art as a, as a design tool for for social change? Um, definitely. So. I mean, I think the art is, again, just going back to the point of uh, honoring us, right? Um, you know, honoring our ancestors, honoring our journey, um, and giving a sense of meaning. Um, it should never be as if we were never here. And we know that gentrification, um, in many ways, um, is ethnic cleansing and erasure, right? And so we even see in the real estate industry where they come in and they rename places, right? Like Noha, they tried that one, North of Harlem, or North Harlem, right? You know, they renamed, I mean, just the idea of, you know, just renaming the places that we exist in now, right? These were not the names that were called by the indigenous people. Um, and so, you know, being able to put, again, our experience, um, our journey into, uh the 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 environment around us uh to give those positive uh inputs uh and reflections uh, is important and so building off a of liberty bank building um we had um uh nine community-based artists um do art to tell the story of of liberty bank which was the um only first and only black bank in washington state second uh west of the mississippi um and uh, we kind of got in that process late because it was a community, you know, kind of struggle and effort to, to get to where we were and some things were already designed. And so really the opportunity there was, you know, more of after the design was done. So there's a, you know, beautiful mural on the building by Al Doggett. There's art inside by many artists from the community, including uh, Inye Wakoma with Wanawari, who is a longtime artist in the community is on the call. Um, shout out to Inye. Um, and I think there was, you know, about maybe three hundred thousand dollars, three or four hundred thousand dollars that went into the community. But when it came to, and then in between that, before Africa Town Plaza was actually built, you can see if you look at my image, you kind of see a little bit. We did a temporary activation to really represent what we had gotten gathered through the community uh, process of imagining and designing, you know, imagining a future, you know, that includes us, that reflects us and reflects our, our, our best. And the ideas that came out of what people wanted to see in the future, we did a temporary activation on the site of Midtown uh, Center before it was dis de uh, demolished for redevelopment. And a lot of people, you know, were like, well, why would you do something like this if it's gonna be torn down? And it was really about projecting our, you know, vision for the future, you know, onto the future. It was temporary in this space, but the ideas were adopted. And so now you go to 23rd and Union and on the buildings that have already been developed um, uh, by Lake Union Partners, you see black images of black, you know, uh, people from the community life, but done by many artists there. Um, and then Africatown Plaza, again, we wanted to take it a step further and have not just you know, a part of art applied to the building that reflects us or art in the building that reflects us or around the building, but the actual building itself be, you know, um, art, right? And so we, you know, we went, we, this time we had an actual international um, art call. We have artists from across the country and even, you know, um, as far as uh, uh, Africa um, and all over the world that submitted who will be, you know, helping to tell the story of, you know, the aspirations, the journey of the community. But again, the building in it itself um, represents uh, Afrocentric uh, uh, design, right? And so um, 
that, you know, in this time. So, you know, just through this work, you know, um, not only putting us into the environment, but again, supporting our, our, our creatives, right? And so now you can see, um, you know, that image and, 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 you know, through the process and the website, you'll be able to understand what the inspirations, you know, for that building. But this building looks different than any other building, you know, um, in, in the area um, because it is reflecting um, our own, you know, um, uh, design aesthetics, you know, and ways of being. So um, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is, this is some of the ways and we want to continue to evolve, you know, and so, um, yeah, just looking forward to continue to have the, you know, our design and our community. Um, I think another aspect is, is giving the community voice and tools to express itself. Cause again, we, the way we exist is a, is, is art in itself, you know, but it's not often able to be translated into certain spaces. We've been maybe limited to stages and music and maybe some fashion aspects, but why is this also not reflected in every aspect of design from the building design to product design, you know, everything that's not growing out of the ground has to be designed, right? And we have our own unique, you know, aesthetics and, and perspectives that are very, very, uh, 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 very, um, uh, what would you say? Um, diverse, right? When you think about the, the diaspora of our experiences um, um, across the world as, as Black people, um, there's, a, there's a rich menu to draw from, and we want to continue to make space for that to happen. And I think that's part of the, the innovation. We don't even know what is to be yet. And again, just honoring the many creatives that have come from the community, from, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix to Zenobia Bailey to Ray Charles and Quincy Jones to, uh, you know, D. Charlene Williams, who was a beautician, you know, again, hair, that's another aspect of our, our art and design, um, to uh, Ishmael Butler of Diggable Plant. I mean, there's so many, right? And then just the people who have not become that prominent, that, that influenced those people who became prominent, right? And so, again, making space for even just our everyday aesthetics and style to, to become uh, celebrated, honored, and um, uh, crystallized in bricks and mortar. Yeah, this is so I exciting, honestly, because when we think about art, you know, we understand that there is such a legacy of art in Black communities. And to be bringing that legacy out into these uh, spaces and places and living legacies is so phenomenal. And I love being able to witness it now. Um, and I know Africatown Plaza is just going to be exploded uh, with this art. So that's really exciting. And when we think about these innovative ways that, you know, both of your organizations approach design and development, we want to speak to now some of the challenges that you experience incorporating art into these amazing projects. Uh, when you think about, you know, arts and culture integration in community development work, I'll uh, send this over to you, uh, Mama Shu, uh, right here for this one. You know, what are some of those challenges that you've experienced? Uh, uh, some of the challenges, um, and, and I guess maybe this is like a, a, a big bulk of it is, is that, you know, sometimes people don't want to uh, change or do things differently. And so a lot of times they're locked in and unfortunately locked into a situation that is not good for them. And, and they don't know how to uh, come out of it. And so sometimes, um, you know, when you're thinking about something, you're needing um, uh, support from maybe um, City Hall or uh, just other folks that maybe just don't get it. Um, sometimes you just have to do the thing and you have to just show them. And that is one of the things that I felt that we had to do to show them because this project is uh, uh, one that I intended to be infectious for people to actually see what they can actually do with the space, their own living space, right in their own backyard, right in the lot right next to them of what they can do. But if you don't have the support of maybe um, uh, uh, the city officials at that time, I have support, uh, more support now, but at that time it was a, a pretty tough. Like I said, even about the street lights, we went in there like, hey, uh, you know, let's start them, but that we had to do it some other way to basically show. So those were some of the challenges too, when maybe you're, uh, you know, you're, other people are not ready, but you know, you wanna, you know, bring something 
a change about a change. So there's a, there's a struggle uh, right there in itself of just uh, belief systems of uh, people wanting things to stay the same and not wanting to move. And um, also uh, outdated ordinances and things like that that don't allow you to actually uh, do certain things. Um, I recall one of the challenges that I had uh, with obtaining one of the uh, lots actually right next door to uh, the Moon Ministry, which was the very first property that we obtained for the village, is that um, I was trying to get the side lot. And then sometimes when you don't get everybody working the way that they're supposed to be working in the office and you're putting in these applications, it's just a lot of red tape um, in the beginning um, you know, just trying to get things done. It is just so rough. And then sometimes when you, you know, you go to the counters, like you can't do that. And in my mind, I'm like, hmm, okay, that's all I say, because I already know what's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? I already know that I'm not going to stop. So, and, and, and it's, it's always other ways. And so I, I got in trouble for putting up that very first street, street light um, because um, I didn't own the lot yet. It took so long and I'm like, you know what? There was a 30 foot sinkhole right down there in, in the street. The, the street was dark. Plus there's a school right across the street. <laughs> and I would sit on the porch and watch these kids go to school every day and they would walk down the block. And then I put wood over the, um, the sinkhole because I didn't want them to be hurt. And you know, children are very, very um, you know, inquisitive. They wanna go and go poke around and everything. Also at night when there's blight and there's no homes, there's no lights, even on porch lights or anything. So cars would race on down. They would actually run over the actual um, barricade, uh, wooden barricade and um, just roll over it. And, and so uh, there was some trouble then. So my $250 lot back then, it cost me $1,000. I got a ticket. Um, well, I was gonna get a ticket for, um, they called it trespassing. And, um, but I was the only one that was gonna be able to get the lot and everything, but that was just um, a, a challenge, but I wanted it and I purchased it and um, it was just by any means necessary. Since then or whatever, I have purchased it and uh, got that out the way, as well as 45 other properties on the block to be able to build and do whatever it is that we wanna do um, on there. So sometimes the belief systems and, and people just think that you can't. And sometimes folks are just flat out just stuck, you know, and they're stuck in the, the, the poverty ways and everything. And it's just so very sad. So the thing about um, uh, this development is that it was, it's, it's to a show me, like you can really do this and you could just be a regular, look, you could just be a regular old mom like I was, you know, like, hey, we can do this and just pull every, everybody together. So that was uh, one of the challenges as well. Sometimes obtaining the property to do the things that you actually uh, want to do. Amazing. Uh, it sounds like you and were finding all of the creative ways to get around all those challenges. That's, <laughs> art, that's, that's art in itself, but, you exactly. know, that's an art in itself, navigating all, you know, just black people Man. surviving what we've survived is a, is an art in itself. But yeah. I, I just wanted to have an opportunity because I don't know if this was said clearly, you know, that despite all of the challenges, Mama Shu, what has what is Avalon Village today? What have you been able, you know, you mentioned just, you know, one property and then I heard you just throwing 45. So can yeah. you can you really let people know, you know, from that first property that you you bought where things are with the Avalon Village so today? So the very first, the very first one that we um we got was the ministry. Um, and it was boarded up when I lived there, the one I bought for $3,000. I didn't take the boards off until the next year. I made sure everything was tight on the inside and all of that. So we got that, we got that property. And then I was able to go ahead and get the homework house, this house. And I got that for like $2,300 as well. It was just this big old thing. Shoo, you can't do it. Oh my God, they need to tear this down. And I'm like, don't these people see a homework house here don't they see kids milling out of it and you know and just all on the playground and just sitting having lunch and reading books and playing so this is what I saw so it's almost like something I just couldn't unsee so basically what I did was is that I was sitting on the block and this is a, a true story too I was sitting on my uh, porch and um I was trying to get this land across the street uh which uh to build the stem lab and it was four parcels and uh, it was 
just the toughest thing, um, you know, couldn't do this. I had to do a development thing and I did, and it just was just so uh, slow. And I, and I recall, and I just heard this, it was like, shoo, move up the block, just go up the block. And I'm like, okay. And so what I did was I just looked up everything that was two digits. My block is two digits, the addresses. And so I looked up everything to, in the Wayne County Land Bank. And I also looked at uh, the, the Michigan uh, State uh, Land Bank as well as the city of Highland Park. And what I did was is that I kind of did this, um, what do you call it, like an aerial view. I had my civil engineer friend take a picture of, the, the, of my whole block. And what I did was is that I, um, I went to Office Depot and I got these yellow stickers. And so on all the blight, I actually put what it is that I actually wanted to put in those spaces on the entire block and the property that I wanted to uh, obtain to make things happen. And so when I did this, I kind of checked it off each thing that I was able to um, accomplish. So then I was uh, the, the Wayne County uh, Land Bank. I bought what I could um, from uh, the land bank and most of it was land because I wanted to develop it from the ground up and create something beautiful. And so over time, I just chipped off and just, you know, just anything that was available, I just got it. Um, I presented my uh, development thing. I want to put a community garden here and this and that, and I was able to get it. So now Avalon Village is 45 properties strong. Um, we basically own about 98% of this very first block off of Woodward Avenue. Um, I have five neighbors um, and the six residents uh, included. The other homes are things that we do in, in them. Maybe we have five structures. And the rest is just beautiful land and I have plans for that. But I just, I, I remember when it was just so clear and, and, and that's the thing too. And I don't even know if this is like something that we could talk about right now. But the thing about it is, is that sometimes we just get focused on a thing. And sometimes we could just go ahead and just be doing that low hanging fruit stuff like, okay, come up off of that. And I had to come up off of that because that right there was waiting. Then later on that came so very smooth. I was able to get those four properties to be able to get that STEM lab, but then I was able to get more as I was, you know, delving down. And I have properties in the second block as well, just a couple of properties there um, as well, with the goal in 10 years of transforming all of the blocks of Avalon Street in Highland Park. So that's where we are as it relates to um, uh, properties. And that does include the home that Ellen, uh, the Ellen Show donated. That is our city hall. The idea of the village is to create a whole working space with my government and everything. I have, um, I don't have, we have a police force. It's not called police. It's called the Avalon Village Peace Team because that's what officers used to be called back in the day. They were called peace officers. And so basically they're trained to come with peace and to make sure that things are balanced and to be really, really affirmative and positive. But also they're able to go the other way if need be. Wow. So phenomenal. And uh, I love how you said that white King, cause that in and of itself is art. Right. And, you know, uh, this is just a, such an amazing example of what can be done when you take that determination and utilize the resources you have. And like you said, I love the yellow sticker story, chipping it off one property at a time, knowing exactly how you can look at the entire whole of the block and think about how to redevelop it so that it's really purposeful and, you know, becomes one of those essential blocks for the whole community. Thank you so much, Mama Shu. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of winding down on our time here, but I want to get this question in to both of you all, because when we think about this work, oftentimes we talk about it. And even in your example there, Mama Shu, you know, needing the resources to maximize the impact um, of art on community building, but also there's a part that funders can play to support this work, especially for organizations like Avalon Village and ACLT that are developing in a non-traditional way. Uh, let's just talk a bit about the resources that are needed to continue this work and how funding partners can really uh, connect with organizations like yours to further the work. I'll start with you here, Waikine. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things is that we need to approach things um, from a reparative and a restorative framework, right? Communities have endured significant, you know, extraction of wealth, equity, you know, since we've been here uh, in this country. Um, and, um, and so, you know, 
we focus on shifting the resources to be under, you know, when we think about building a new normal rooted in equity, we've advocated for, you know, land and access to capital to develop in ways that can, you know, again, be restorative and heal our community from past traumas. But it's also about being in control of the resources that are supposed to impact our lives. And what we see is that, you know, government is control, you know, and at the end of the day, government is people. But many times those people that are in the government or in, you know, different administrative roles are not rooted in and connected to or accountable to the community. Two, when we get to the nonprofit or fill it, fill, you know, the nonprofit sector, we've had many nonprofits, you know, build themselves up as, on our behalf, you know, our intermediary. They're, they're helping us as if we can't help ourselves, you know, as if we haven't been, again, innovative, creative, and helping ourselves to survive the consistent and continuous attacks on our well being, you know, throughout our time of being here. So, again, shifting those resources. Right now, you know, there's more resources that have been allocated by the federal government in, you know, um, in, in, in my lifetime, right, with the, you know, uh, ARPA, the American Recovery, you know, Act, and then the infrastructure bill, right, that's three, over three trillion dollars that's been, you know, put into um, uh, the country and, and to our communities, we need to be making sure those uh, dollars are being directed toward these, this type of development. And lifting up Queens, you know, like Mama Shu, one of my mentors, Gus Newport, you know, who led the restoration of uh, Dudley Square in, in, in Boston and established that land trust and things. He said what they found through their process was that, you know, mothers made the best urban planners because they were the ones that were facing all of the challenges in terms of dealing with their children and moving through streets that were inefficient, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so thinking about even NeighborWorks, which is a national federal program, was started by a Black woman in Pittsburgh, right? So a lot of things that come to be national policy start with a community person, you know, community development corporations in general. Um, when another one of my mentors, the, the late um, Abu Boutika Sonny Carson, they started the Restoration uh, Community Development Corporation with uh, Robert Kennedy. That was the first CDC in the country. So again, starting from community and lifting up before there's a formal, you know, anything, there's a seed in the community. There's dedicated community people. Uh, Mama, she said, just a mom. There's no such thing as just a mom, you know, because, uh, you know, mothers, you know, they make, they say the hand that rocks the cradle, right? It, 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 it controls, you know, um, uh, the future of the, of the nation, right? Or society or civilization. So I think highlighting, and that's what, you know, we've attempted to do with identifying people that are on the ground doing the great work, you know, without necessarily maybe being acknowledged in certain ways or resource to make sure they do get resourced, right? And so, um, you know, as they say, those that are closest, you know, to the problem, those are most impacted, you know, the ones who are closest to the solution as well. So taking the extra time to find the gems, you know, the hidden treasures in our communities and providing them, because they're gonna do more, they've done more with less, likely they'll do more with more, right? While others have done less with more for decades and our communities have continued to get to, to, to get worse. So that's one thing. Um, and I, I would just say, you know, to the point of um, challenges, it's, you know, a lot of times the mindset, you know, um, in, 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 in both the status quo of how things have been done and people just continuously looking to do it that way. And then oftentimes in our community, our spirits have been defeated by the ongoing attacks on so many levels and people just being consumed with surviving, right? And, you know, kind of not having that hope for thriving anymore or, or knowing that we can get to that place. And so again, restoring that, inspiring people, you know, and this is what, you know, again, quote unquote, just a mom is building a whole community. Well, we have lots of just the moms around, right? So if everyone could, you know, really understand that we have the power to make these changes and then we go and make sure the resources are supporting this change at the community level, I think we will see a significant amount of change um, um, happen at an accelerated rate in our community. But we have to make sure the resources and the policies are um, prioritizing reparations, you know, restoration and making people whole, whole 
who have been clearly damaged by well-documented policies and practice of public and private sector for you know um, generations, decades, centuries. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Mama Shu, when you think about this this work, you know, how do you see you know resources coming in to this work, and you know, philant philanthropic partners being intentional about their connection to uh, bringing more resources to this work? Uh, what I see is what I want, um, and a lot of us want is that some of us, and, and to go back to just a mom, I go back, I did an interview with um, NBC and they call me the unlikely urban planner. I do a lot of tours and I do a lot of talks and everything to students who are actually urban planners. And I never went to school for it. I just actually did it. What I would like to see is more resources, more grant funding, more um, ways that uh, uh, people who have vision, um, people who are on the ground, people like you said, uh, uh, the mothers and other folks, that they know what the issues are and we know exactly where to go and what is actually needed in these neighborhoods. And I would like the, um, more funding to go to neighborhood buildings. I see like downtown is being built up and other areas, but our area here, we don't get funding for those kind of uh, people who just wanna do better and wanna make things better in the neighborhood. And hopefully I just, just more community friendly uh, dollars uh, uh, that, um, that also see some of the work that has already been done and be able to help to attach to that and to add to that, to that person, uh, that person or that group's work and let that be um, uh, 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 something that they can see. Basically what you see is what you get and, and let them just go ahead and build on it. And for it not to have any restrictions on it, especially if they're doing what it is that they say that they're doing. Yeah. That's, that's really important. I think so much of this too is uh, we always talk about it in terms of being relational and not transactional, right? And so when you have those real relationships and you're connecting with, um, you know, organizations that are doing the work on the ground, it makes it easier for you as a funder, no matter what the background you have, but when you really have those relationships, it does make it easier for you to actually see the work that is happening on the ground to be able to fund it. So thank you for that. Um, I, I I know we had some issues with the chat, but I, I want to just make it clear here that there we had a couple other questions that I think are really pertinent to this because um, one of the things that you were mentioning, Mama Shu, was about you know a lot of the gun violence and trauma that had existed there in Avalon Village, but and you didn't know, right? And and yet you know, many people understood that history. So how can, you know, communities in the Central District and Highland Park um, who have experienced that level of trauma and displacement, gun violence um, and other wounds, how can we make sure that redevelopment is intentional about using art for healing and creating spaces of comfort? I'll let you go first on this one, Mama Shu. Okay, so one of the things is, is that just the building of the village actually is just one big shrine because there were so many lives lost on this block. Um, but in my own personal way, how I feel, I feel that the ancestors give us um, the energy and they empower us. And if they did that or whatever while they were living, they surely can do that when they're not physically here. And that is what the energy that I actually rely on. So I place certain energies in certain spaces and certain shrines or whatever to be activated and to uh, draw from the energies. So specifically, I'll say that my uh, two sons, for instance, this picture right here, that's up, uh, that's my baby boy, that's Jacoby Ra. Um, and his name is, uh, he's a star. Ra is Egyptian God of the sun and Jacoby means star. And so this was one of the very first entities along with uh, the ministry, my house, the first house that I built the uh, park simultaneously. But this is very, very healing, but also it reminds me of the energy of Jacoby. His dad was a music, is a musician. And so the, the, even the music uh, camp is called Sunboy Records. And I created a record label for children, um, musicians, so that they can make records safely, so that they can not be exploited, so they would learn to be an entrepreneur, eat right and everything if you're gonna be touring. Those are some of the things that uh, came out of that uh, 
experience. But like I said, the way that it happened, he was hit by a car, but that space is for concerts. Um, I married people there in the park. It's, it ha we have free Wi-Fi, so people sit in the park and they just enjoy the park. And so that area, so therefore I, I feel my uh, son's energy as well. And also it's shared. And, and that has been a healing uh, journey as well. And then I have a, a, another shrine, my other boy, uh, uh, his name is Chinyelu, Chinyelu Geb Kehero. Um, Chinyelu means invincible. And he was definitely my Aries boy. He was something else. Um, he was just a, a, a fireball. And so we built a shrine. But what we did was, is that we got um, a volunteer carpenter and we got Chinyelu's friends. And Chinyelu's friends actually helped to build his shrine. They helped to clean out the area for his park. Um, there's uh, flowers and everything like uh, eight or 10 raised beds. Um, and so it's lit with solar lighting. And so it's a space for them to sit and chill and just um, basically just talk about their boy and just all kinds of stuff, you know. And they sit up there and they just do their things safely in that area. When Chinyelu was living, I used to, we had this, since we had the land across the street, he would have all of his friends' cars all lined up and they would just sit up there and just, you know, do they chilling because it was important for them to have a safe space. Sometimes they're hassled so much by all of the other outside stuff, you know, um, sometimes law enforcement or people that think that they're just not um, doing right. So I told Chi and I said, you know what, we about to just, uh, you know what, create this and have your friends or whatever come over here. And that's exactly what they did. So when he got killed and he got killed on this block and ran across on the second block and actually died in his friend's house, he ran away or whatever. He always protect me. He ran away from the gunfire just, and I was sitting in the house at the time um, on a board of Ed call. And I just recall that. And the first thing that popped up to my mind because he was doing security is that I know what he did. He ran away so that they wouldn't shoot up, you know, where I was. He didn't want to. My boy was something else. Because even in his dying moments, I hear him came, he, it just came to me so clear about what he did. So this particular thing is actually so healing for me because it helps me to continue to create. And also I know that we have, I have ambassadors in the heavens. So I have two boys and I have a bonus son that I actually eulogize here in the village. And I put their faces on a basketball court. So we're a they're able to play and their friends are able to enjoy things. And so we just need that because there's so much grief surrounding um, that gun violence and all of that, that these children and especially these young men, they don't know what to do. They don't have a space to actually uh, heal. And so that is what we do. And so we just, we, and so basically what I show them is that death is a part of all of this of life and we have to embrace it all. So I want you to sit in it. I want you to drink your do say in it. I want you to have your spliff in it. I want you to plan and do things in it and just engulf yourself in it because it is a part of what, what it is in this lifetime right now that we deal with. And so my children, that is what the shrines, that is what's special. Even I have shrine spaces for other uh, beautiful humans that have um, entered our lives. We have a somewhere called Jindai Gardens. It was this beautiful sister. Her name was Jindai. And she would take photos of us um, just all over the city. This was her thing. She was showed up at everything. So we have an apple orchard for her. And it's down on the other end next, next to where the cafe is going to be. Her husband... His name is uh, Kalinde, and he's an ancestor as well. We're building a fire pit in his name. So the thing for me is, is that um, all of it is the same, life and death, and we have to enjoy it and embrace it and take it for what it really, really is and still be able to uh, uh, go. And I feel that my two boys 
and anybody else who has been through this, this uh, uh, situation and they're able to see a lot of the moms, they come and they say, you know what, I want to do that too. And I show them how they can start because they don't know where to start. And you have to do something. When something like that happens, you got to do. It's just so much on you. You need to get it out. And so to me, grief and joy is the same. Such a beautiful um, example of how to create space for healing. That's very intentional. Thank you so much for sharing, Mama Shu, and for you know uh, taking taking your own personal experiences to another level. Where now it's something that the community gets to also rejoice and heal in. Thank you so much for that, uh, White King. When we think about uh, gun violence, we we know that uh, we talk about this all the time here in Seattle, you know, the central district South end having this kind of history of gun violence. How do we take that, that, that trauma and utilize art in our spaces to really be healing spaces for all of that that's experienced in our society? Um, that's a good question, you know, and I can't say that I have the answer yet. You know, um, we've, We've had a lot of losses, you know, just last week. Um, I had, a, you know, a, one of my nieces, you know, a community niece that was raised, you know, through our house and everything was just found shot dead as a part of a double homicide in, in, um, <clears throat> in a car, you know. Um, and her father was actually one, he was the bass player that used to come to our house and, and play, play, play with my father. And, I think about this, you know, um, yesterday was the, or the fifth was the anniversary of my, one of my younger cousins who passed last year and his son passed the previous July, you know, so July has been a rough, rough uh, road recently. Um, what I, what I know is that it has to be something that is embraced by those that who are impacted right so it's not just you know sometimes people have an intention oh we're going to put this up we're going to commission this artist to do something in the name of this but it doesn't really connect with the heart and soul of the community and the everyday people of the community that have been impacted and lived through you know the good the bad the joy the pain of the community right um, because, you know, obviously, you know, Jimi Hendrix is always going to be on a mural, you know, Quincy Jones is always going to, but there's so many more people that were beloved to our community that are not known, you know, at that level. And it really has to come from those who are impacted in terms of what really best represents, you know, we can't just, you know, again, put up a mural you know, and, and that is one of the challenges, you know, with the level of trauma that people have faced, not only through these, ex these experiences that have been engineered into our community, the drugs and the gun violence, we don't produce the drugs, we don't <laughs> produce the guns, but it just happens that all, so much of the activity is in our communities, you know, we know that's not by accident, but that's by design, right? And, and then the, the, the another design, intentional design, which has been to displace us from these communities and the way that it's happened has been very traumatic to people. So even as we do these projects, there are people who have not yet found it safe for them to come. They don't feel safe in the community. They feel that they're like, you know, foreigners in a community that, you know, new people are looking at them like, what are they doing here? They just, the change is just you know, the, the restaurant they knew, the corner store they knew, the different things, you know, they haven't, they don't feel connected to anything new. And so as we build things new, which we always should renew, I mean, life, the cycle of life is about renewal, right? Um, how do we, you know, do it in a way that, you know, the people also are the art again, right? There, it's dynamic, it's not static, right? Again, it's not static, right? It's dynamic, it's moving, it's living. And those are the people that are living, right? And so the community is the canvas and the people are the both the creators and the art that is created. Now, how do we get back to that, you know, in a situation where we're so, you know, we're still being systemically 
you know, excluded and attacked. And, and, and people feel that, right? They can't always articulate it, but they feel it. So this is really where innovation and creative and working with the community directly to come up with these solutions. You know, we don't, we don't know one of us has all of it, but among us and within us is all of it, right? And so how do we get to that? How do we tap into that? You know, when so many have been, you know, um, pushed to a place of tapping out, right? And that's what we've seen, you know? And so it's, it's challenge. It, it is a challenge to get people to tap back in, you know, whether communities were allowed to, you know, go down so much that people that wanted a certain type of life, they just left, right? And then those are the community builders. Those are your doctors, your entrepreneurs. And so who's left in the community, you know? And so um, that is a, that is a, that is a, that is a challenge that I don't think, you know, we necessarily have the answer to, but the answer is again, among us within us. So I think getting together, which is another part, you know, so it's not just about putting up the static things, but actually creating a spaces, you know, the, the street festivals and, you know, things that we do to, to, to bring us back together. Cause in our interaction, in our connection, that's what it's really about. And we're just striving to, again, connect us with, better images of ourselves, better experiences with ourselves, you know, so that we can heal, restore and create, you know, create even greater, right? Let our future be even greater than our, than our, than our past because it's powered by that past. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if that was a specific answer, but it's the reality that, you know, just because we put something up doesn't mean it automatically connects. So we have to stay connected in the process. And that's another thing for us. Development is a long process, right? Yeah. So, you know, the time you get some people's ideas to the time that it comes into reality, there's a gap in there in the type of development that we're doing, right? So how do we, again, maintain the connection? So one is restoring the connection and then retain, uh, maintaining and sustaining the connection, um, that's a that's an ongoing creative way that we have to do that. And I think it's giving everyone a brush, you know, giving everyone an instrument, letting everyone have the opportunity to contribute some of their energy and their perspective um, and value is what makes people feel more connected. And that's the solution to me um, that is, you know, forever being developed. It's like a living document, you know, it's not static. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. And I, th I think you're right. It's, you know, it's one of those kind of things that's tough to answer because it's something that's ever evolving. So thank you both for those answers. Uh, we got a couple minutes left, but I, there's there's another question here that I think is so pertinent. You know, I, I'll, I'll direct this one to Mama Shu. And if I have time, I have another one I want to direct to you, Y King. But Mama Shu, when, when you think about all the work that you're doing, you know, what is the end result? What is it at mass scale? What does it all the way look like for people to be able to envision with you in terms of Avalon Village? Uh, you know, you get all the resources you need, you get the property you need. What is that final product um, in terms of, you know, the, the impact to community and what you're looking to do at Avalon Village? So the whole big goal of Avalon uh, is to basically show people how they can transform their own blight uh, to something beautiful. So they can do something as simple, even like I said, starting from um, their vacant lot, even their own backyards, land around them in your own neighborhood to start building up there. But the goal and the vision for Avalon Street, there's four blocks of Avalon uh, Street from all the way from uh, Woodward Avenue to Hamilton. And uh, they have a, a lot of vacant, vacant land and some houses that need to be torn down as well. But my goal is to create this particular block is mixed use. And so I'm just putting all kinds of basketball courts. Um, like I said, the cafe, STEM lab, we have the village hall there. So that is what this is meant to be. This is meant to be the quote unquote downtown area of the village, the very first block. The second, third, and fourth block, my vision is to transform that blight into beauty by adding um, energy efficient uh, housing and also um, street lights, more street lights down on the other blocks, an urban garden, and also a playground family area on each of those blocks where they have their, uh, uh, you know, their own. Uh, so of course, they can come down here on the first block as well, but those that's how they would be organized. And then also changing all of the blocks uh, uh, name to Avalon Village. We were able to go to city council uh, last year in 2021 in September and to actually uh, 
changed the actual name of Avalon Street to Avalon Village and Woodward Avenue. So maybe next, when you come up here, you'll actually see uh, that change. I'm supposed to be getting that sign maybe in about two weeks and they're gonna come and the city will be putting it up. So that was really um, an, an accomplishment um, in addition to uh, the infrastructure, but that is the total uh, goal of this project. And then also, um, I, uh, I also speak and also advise and consult on how people can start with what they have in order to build the village. Some people want to know, how do you do this? And, you know, what do you do to start in everything? And so, you know, just basically uh, showing folks how they can actually do that. And like I said in the beginning, this is something that I wanted to be infectious to basically help to have something beautiful in Highland Park. A lot of times we just get so dogged out about, um, you know, our surroundings, Highland Park ain't this, it ain't that, and it's all of that. And so basically to help to be a shining example of what we could be and, and what we are and what we can actually evolve into just with a little vision and also with a lot of hard work and uh, just consistency and focus. Yeah. Beauty, beauty, beauty. Uh, I'm going to squeeze this in here, White King. Uh, really thank you for for sharing your losses. I, me too. I just was at a funeral this week. My cousin was shot and killed. And, and I, I realized that oftentimes as somebody who's, you know, so heavily involved in this work, you know, I, we always go back to what can we do more? How can we inform the next generation about how to, to understand, you know, all the passion that we're pouring into our community? Because oftentimes they don't really even see all that, right? They see the end result. When Africatown Plaza is built, they're going to see that. But what is something that you would share with uh, young leaders in terms of how they can, you know, carry on these torches of, of the work that is being planted with Africatown Community Land trust, how they can, uh, you know, utilize, you know, your model as a way to infuse their own leadership. I will share Mama's shoe with them, which is what I'm striving to do right now to be, and that's, and that's not, that's, that's, that's just being real, you know, I mean, because if you go, you, I mean, a lot of us have heard about Detroit, Highland Park is like, it's weird, it's a city within, it's a municipality within the city of Detroit, so for everyone else is Detroit, but I'm sure I don't want to say that in Highland Park, right? You know, because, uh, you know, they would say this is Highland Park, right? And it was a prominent Black community, actually, right? And so, but then when you see what has happened and, you you know, in, in many places, you know, North Philly, you know, Cleveland, you know, many places, you know, we just, we're, we give up and we don't, we don't, we forget that we have built things, you know, with less, Right. You know, and that's, again, the whole spirit of Sankofa, the principle of Sankofa. I would give them that principle as well to look back. Don't let's not just look back at our down times. Right. Let's look at our great times. And then we want to understand, well, how were we thinking? How were we relating to ourselves? How were we relating to each other when we produced these great things which continue to impact the world today. Some of them are still standing. Some of them are systems that we still use like university systems, you know, and, and many other systems, right? And so I would give them the blessing. I would give them their inheritance, meaning look even into your own family line, right? Your family, I mean, we think about Seattle, the people that came to Seattle from Louisiana and Texas, you know I mean? This is like as far as you can get North without being in Canada and West without being in Pacific Ocean. They were pioneers. They came here and they established things against all odds. You know, they came, our people came out of shadow slavery, landless and different things like that. And they still accumulated and built, you know. And I heard um, um, uh, Shirley Shiraz said on, on hers, coming out of slavery, our people had, you know, two major focuses, get education and get land, right? And so again, giving them, um, the access to the knowledge, you know, of the past, you know, so that they can activate it in the, in the present, knowing that this is what's in, what's in them, giving them the ability to tap into themselves and tap into each other, you know, power, right? Because our young people are still moving the world, right? In many ways, their culture, their energy is powering. Whatever they put their energy to, positive or negative, becomes something that is many others, you know, 
adopt and, and, and take on. So if they put it in the building, their communities, and that's, that becomes something, right? And understanding that, you know, generational wealth and different things like that. And so I would say, you know, you know, people say hope or vision that there is possibility that they have the ability to imagine, design, and build the life that they want, the community they want, and the world that they want, right? These are things that, you know, I would strive to give. And then all, other than that, we just give real opportunities, right? Like we want young people to get involved in working and building these projects. We want them to help design. We want them to, you know, start businesses that go into these buildings. So also giving them something tangible and not just, you know, um, ideas, but, you know, and that's part of our work is to just give a demonstration because any one project is not going to make a community, just like one house doesn't make a community, right? But what these projects, I think that Africatown has been able to complete, like such as, you know, Liberty Bank and Africatown Plaza and the William Gross Center brings the possibilities that if we could do this without everyone, and without a lot of people, with just a few people being dedicated, imagine how much more we can do with more people. And as a younger person, having the benefit of the experiences that we've gone through to this point, that means that they can go further and they can go higher. So those are the things that I would seek to, 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 to give to them um, in the, as they develop in their own leadership and, and greatness. Oh, well, this has just been so phenomenal. Thank you both. I know we went a little bit over time, but I just, I had to get those questions in with y'all. And Mama Shu, I love how you said when you come, because I'll definitely be coming to visit Avalon right. Village uh, already. Uh, I'll make sure I get connected and plugged in. But I just want to really thank you guys heartfeltly because this conversation series, you know, as somebody who just adores this work, I've been in this work. Uh, Why King knows, like, I, I, I love this work. And to hear from so many people across the country to understand how we are being intentional to build thriving Black communities across this nation is so inspiring and it's important to uplift this work. Thank you so much, Mama Shu, for all that you're doing down there in Michigan. Of course, I will be there to come visit soon. And and thank you again, Waikin, for everything you're doing for the Pacific Northwest. You You know, you both are really setting examples in, in such a high regard. And so many people really respect you all. We can see there was so much love in the chat pouring in for both of you sharing your stories and the the personal connection that you have to this work. So thank you both again. I now have the pleasure of introducing our board member vice chair, Auntie Jacqueline Armstrong. Uh, She's going to tell you about how you can make an impact into this work. Welcome, Auntie Jackie. Hey, thank you so much, Trayon. And I just want to say that the conversation, not only today, but the past three weeks has been so informative. I have learned so much about the work that we're doing, and I'm so inspired. But right now, I want you to just take a couple of minutes to donate to these two organizations that are doing amazing work. And while you're going to the websites, and there's also links in the chat, I'd like to share with you my personal connection to the Central District and why the the work of Avalon Village and AC, ACLT matters. You know, I grew up in the CD in the 50s and 60s and 70s when bell bottoms, afros, um, black power, I'm black and I'm proud. We were out there. We were proud of our culture and our heritage. And of course, being in the Pacific Northwest, well, we didn't get all of the, the latest on black culture. We weren't Detroit, but we had a strong community. I grew up when it was 80% black home owners ownership, when the community was a closeness community, we enjoyed the the culture, the music even reflected our community. We remember Jackson 5 and uh, Curtis Mayfield, Keep Coming Up, Don't Stop, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? The music and the pop culture and all that was going on was part of my community that I grew up in. But I also realized that I'm a survivor of gentrification, not to say that gentrification is gone, but that I am still here in the same house that my parents purchased 75 years ago. And to go through gentrification, walking out into my backyard or, or my porch and seeing those ugly orange cranes all over the CD, just picking out Miss Jackson's house like it was a little stick and destroying it, clearing the land. And six months later, it's an aluminum building 
that mm. has a price tag that says $800,000. I'm walking around traumatized. So the healing and building of a community has been so important because we need to be healed. If anybody has lived through gentrification, you know the traumatization of feeling like everything has been taken from you. We've been raped. Our homes have been destroyed and replaced with beer gardens and dog parks. What's going on? So now, because of the work of Africatown Community Land Trust, and yes, Mama Shu, the Avalon Village, using Black art and culture to design those uh, places of healing and comfort in the Seattle and Detroit area is so important. I agree with Y King. We don't want to be museums and, and just art murals, but I know my healing has come from different major intersections in the CD where I'm looking at uh, Thelma DeWitty. She was the first African-American teacher working in the Seattle Public Schools. And she also was very active in the 50s as the Seattle NAACP president. Those murals at those major intersections are healing me. They're encouraging, inspiring me. And I understand that we also need to have creative places where we can show our Black geniuses, not just murals on the wall, uh, Fitzgerald Beaver and and George Jordan, those are our ancestors, those are our sheroes and heroes, but we have the next generation that needs to know that we also can create community building work that shows our creative genius. So as part of the Thriving Black Communities campaign, our goal is to raise $100,000 to support our community building work. I want you to embrace your power now and help to advance the initiatives that White King and Mama Shu have discussed. White King and Mama Shu can't do it all. And so your contributions, small or large, will help us preserve the legacy of Black Seattle in Highland Park. Imagine, reimagine Black Seattle. And any donation is greatly appreciated. I understand if your money is funny and your change is strange, but look, y'all, we all have gifts, talents, and abilities. Tap in, help with your with your creative genius and how we can create not just murals, but places that people will thrive and become entrepreneurs. So Africatown Community Land Trust and Avalon Village are both 501c3s, and your company might be one that matches employee donations. It's a great opportunity to take advantage of this type of giving program by donating. So again, while I'm talking, I hope that you're going to the websites. I hope you're looking at the links and chats and seeing how you can tap in. This is about struggle. And I'm telling you, people are traumatized from the gentrification of the Central District. My sister doesn't like to come because she says it's so depressing. But what we're doing is we're fighting back that. We are welcoming you back home. Seattle residents, we know that you have been scattered far and wide, that you're now in Renton and Kent and Des Moines and Puyallup. But come home and heal, feel the healing process of all of the, the murals and images. We don't want to be images. We want William Gross Center, the Cultural Innovation Center, to become the catalyst for a Black ecosystem, the catalyst for where we can grow and show our Black creativeness. So please, right now, go to ACLT and the Avalon Village donate pages. The links are on the chat. And if I could just also say, listen, July 16th, we are going to be at the Liberty Bank building. That's from 4 to 8 p.m. Our second annual reunion on union community potluck and block party. That's right. You know, when we get together, there's going to be good view, good food, and good music, and we'll be out in those streets welcoming you back home. Look at the beautiful images and, and people that look like you. I am Africa Town. You are Africa Town. So what will be your role and how will you play that role to help us move forward? Again, I hope to see you at the reunion on Union. Trayana, thank you so much for this time. And again, let's continue this work. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Auntie Jackie, Miss Jacqueline Armstrong, y'all. You heard it from her there. Heartfelt uh, person who has been a legacy resident of the Central District. We love and appreciate you so much. Thank you.
Yes. You guys, I want to thank all of you guys for joining us on this. All of you, uh, I see, I keep saying guys, but I mean, everyone, we want to thank all of you for joining us on this four part conversation series. Honestly, this has been such a phenomenal time to learn, to grow, to imagine and build as my King was saying there, we get to imagine design and build the communities we want to see. We really hope that you guys took some amazing nuggets of information, some inspiration for you to know how you can see yourself as a part of the solution during this series. I want to thank all of the guest speakers from across the country who have joined us on this amazing series. It's been phenomenal. We couldn't have done it without you, the audience. So we definitely want to thank you guys. Of course, continue this conversation using the hashtag thriving black communities out there online. We want to make sure that you guys stay connected and plugged in to these kinds of topics. They are so necessary for us to understand how we are building our communities. We hope that you got that inspiration and that you'll continue to learn from each other, from our successes and our challenges. The collaboration is necessary and let's build collective impact. Before you leave, we want to just let y'all know, I know we had to shut down the chat, but please take your comments into the online world using that hashtag thriving black communities. Thank you all again. And we'll make sure that you guys know once we rev up another conversation series, because it sounds like it's going to be in high demand. Thank you guys. I'm Trey Holiday, and I appreciate you guys for being on this journey with me during this four part conversation series. Thank you, Thank you to ACLT. Thank you. Thank you. And, and please, those that are still with us, leave us a comment about what maybe stood out for you, what you learned here, how you felt about this program. And I just want to share, I mean, I just want to, you know, give gratitude to the team, to Mama Shu for joining us from Highland Park um, and for the team behind us, Trey, um, you know, check Trey, the day with Trey every day on the Converge Media. She's one of our, our faces of Black media, queens of media here. Um, Joanne, who has put this campaign together, John, who has supported, you know, our technology, done a great job with our, you know, video production, um, Mujali um, with Black Dot and Outside Think, you know, just everyone, Amber, um, you know, everyone that has helped make this uh, series, this initial series, you know, I think it's important that we continue to um, highlight and, and, and share and have this knowledge sharing and connecting of brilliance. But just wanted to say thank you. So, you know, please leave us a message. Do you want more? What was good about it? You know, and, um, and, and much gratitude to our team at Africatown Community Land Trust. And definitely to our volunteers. We have some volunteers on the line um, as well. Um, Ash and our vice chair of our board, Ms. Jacqueline. That was awesome, right? <laughs> We might have you doing the hosting next time, uh, Ms. Jacqueline. We appreciate you. Mama Shu, I hope I see you when you come to Seattle. Yes, I want to come. You are more I than welcome. We'll make sure you, you get a, a really good, robust, uh, you know, tour of yeah, what we're doing here. I'm excited. Yeah. I got your number now. I'm going to be texting you. I need to come up and come over there to Michigan. <laughs> Everyone Thanks. take one last chance to private chat to your thanks to this incredible crew. Everyone here on stage, please take a bow and we'll play it out here with the gentleman. Well, we hope we'll play it out here. <laughs> My last piece of producing for you today. Thank you all. Thanks, John. Here we go. Step one, wake up, brother, gonna rise with the sun. Step two, 